Lindsay, it's great to have a chance to sit down with you and talk about the conference that we held, the summit, in fact, that we held in Cambridge just over a couple of months ago. Um, that was an amazing set of conversations, really challenging, really thought provoking, um, but also really, uh, we hope, useful, I think, to drive forward the conversation and make things happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Can you tell me a little bit what you thought the conference revealed to you about the landscape that we're in and the challenges that we have to grapple with? Yeah, it, incredibly rich, valuable conversations, almost impossible to succinctly distill the breadth of insights. But I think there are a number of important themes that emerged. One was that sustainability and geopolitics are intricately intertwined. This is, uh, you know, sustainability is a driver of geopolitics, is absolutely affected by the way geopolitics are playing out. And a kind of really fundamental level, global competition for finite resources is really you know, reshaping um, economic and political agendas. And that has huge implications for responses to sustainability challenges. So that emerged really strongly. Um, there were also uh, surfaced a whole range of, of some of the real challenges, tensions that are barriers to progress. So a broad recognition um, from everyone, you know, people didn't all agree, but they agreed that there's an imperative for collaboration. But we surfaced a whole range of things that are currently getting in the way of that. There are historical and continued injustices between large parts of the world. There are um, concerns, not just concerns, the reality of vested interests, um, of course, defending the status quo, and not yet good enough plans to what the answer is for those that stand to lose from any transition. Um, there are concerns associated with some of that with hypocrisy, the some nations, you know, demanding action by others while they're not themselves walking the talk and taking action. There are clashes of worldviews about ultimately what is it that we are working for and what's the best way to get there. Concerns about imposing solutions that work in one part of the world on other parts of the world when they're frankly not fit for purpose and a frustration that we're not open to and learning quickly enough what does work, scaling what does, letting go of what doesn't but also surface that we don't even always have shared language and sometimes language itself can be a barrier. So even framing the conversation or trying to work out what we might all be working in support of is in itself um, challenging. So a whole range of tensions. We also surfaced and talked a lot about, um, well, in some ways, the amazing power and combination of uh, tech innovation, market forces already driving huge progress, unstoppable, um, but in some places having very significant unintended consequences, uh, impacts not only for inequality, for democratic processes, um, in some places stirring up rather than um, helping to mitigate polarization, um, but also that markets alone and tech innovation alone is not adequate. It's absolutely necessary, valuable, but not meeting all of the places and all of the challenges that are needed. There are some places where there's an imperative, but no near-term business case. And so markets are not the answer in some places yet without the right incentives. And then the final piece that, that came up across the conversations, all of the conversations, was a real deficit of leadership, um, not just in the private sector, but politically, um, it, it kind of a, a global governance levels, a deficit of real leadership ambition, leadership with a clear vision, leadership with real trust and integrity, courage to, to drive things forward. Uh, a recognition that um, it's a very narrow operating space for many leaders at the moment and a huge amount of fear driving decision making, leading to protectionism, nationalism and so on. So I think those were the, the four big themes, geopolitics, global tensions, historic current injustices and tensions, innovation and tech and a real leadership deficit. I want to in that context and, and having laid out the, the that kind of range of challenges um, get your thoughts given the work that you and your teams do which is very focused on international debates international fora um, uh, our engagement in, in multinational uh, processes agreements to get global ambition um, engagement with states uh, and regional policy and ambition what are the implications of those conversations and trends for the work that we and others are doing in support of greater global ambition? I mean, it's really interesting hearing from you that description of the themes of, of, of the, the conversations. And absolutely right. 
it, it's also incredibly significant as we think about, you know, the whole sustainability landscape. We've obviously focused on the the Hero Summit has been often been the model of trying to work out how we solve global problems. Obviously, logically makes sense. We have a global problem. If we can get the world together to agree to solve the problem, then we can advance solutions. And in fact, that has been a model that has delivered huge outcomes. Um, we have, you know, a, a growing, growing range of international policy frameworks in particular that set out our ambition to, to address things like sustainable development through the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, we have the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So, so this, you know, there is a sense that that is giving us progress. But as we reflect on that, particularly in the context that you were just talking about, you know, the fact that, you know, a lot of those have been crafted in a, in a particularly stable geopolitical world um, where um, largely, you know, the US has been the, the hegemonic single most effective power. And we are moving away from it. We're moving into a much more polarised, much more fractured world. Um, we've got competition between the US and China. We've got other things, other countries and power blocks emerging. Um, and, and as you set out so clearly, it was like we also have um, distrust and, uh, you know, different positions developing. So it's going to be harder and harder to sort of see that model being the, the, the most effective, the most important thing. But it is also true, you know, the, um, actually, sustainability does bring us together. It is, it is a genuine global problem. So, it, so where we, you know, if we, we look back on the last 20 years, um, international progress around negotiating new global trade outcomes, have been, has, that's gone into reverse largely, whereas sustainability has moved forward. So, you know, if you think about the climate change COPs, for example, they have been in many ways the most successful um, multilateral process that we've had. Um, but but we clearly have to work out what that means in the new landscape. And I don't think there are easy answers. I think, the, and the conversations that we had during the summit really kind of explored some of that. Um, we have to build on the successes we've got, um, the institutions that we've got matter. The fact that the, the climate change COPs and other things actually allow multiple countries a voice is really, really important. Because in a world where we've got great powers competing for resources, competing for um, who's going to dominate in the industries of the future, which which feels like we're having. So we've got, you know, speakers and, and commentators in the summit talked about um, the massive competition around building kind of new clean energy industries, for example. Having a strong rules-based system is going to be really, really important to make sure that other people don't get trampled, other countries, smaller countries, even medium-sized countries like, like the UK, don't get trampled in, in the race. Um, so, you know... The value of these moments, the value of these kind of spaces for dialogue and discussions and, and, and summits, the realpolitik of thinking about you know, how we navigate that in a world that is increasingly polarised and, and what's, what's needed. Um, but also thinking as we, as we move into a space which is much more about implementing, thinking about what will move us forward and not, not uh, prioritising the kind of the purity of, you know, are we getting a single framework that deals with everything? versus are we making progress and delivering implementation that is actually changing the nature of the economy and the nature of the world and moving us closer towards solutions is going to be really, really important. So, I mean, lots of richness. So specifically in relation to COPs, climate COPs, nature COPs, you've talked about the changing landscape around them and yet their their importance as you know imperfect but necessary. What then is the role of a CISL, the organisations we collaborate with, the uh, organisations we convene? Like what now for COPs? I think that's a really good question. I mean, it links to a question I'd like to ask you in a second, which is about the role of business, because we need we do need to think about that. How how is business engaging? What what should business be prioritising in this landscape? Um, it, it, it includes making sure that we have really clear sense of what each each um, summit can deliver. I think it means looking beyond the climate cops and not just thinking about them, seeing their value as being able to advance different parts of the conversation and act as a place where 
particularly smaller, more vulnerable countries who might not be able to be heard, but who will also be part of the future global economy, part of the future global environment. Um, so need, need to kind of uh, have their voices be taken account. So, so the COPs will be valuable. We need to think about what we can get out of them. We need to think about what other forums and messages and spaces will allow us to, to advance the right messages, but also to acknowledge that we have very, as I said earlier, we have a very full um, set of global frameworks and the priority increasingly going forward is going to be about implementing them. And it might be that we need to spend a bit more time focusing on some of the coalitions that are willing scaling up some of the important action to deliver that. But there was also a really big thread in the conversation was about the fact that although we do have a, a fractured global world with lots and lots of different power blocks and lots of, lots of different interests, that um, it is really important. So, you know, one dynamic, not the only dynamic, is to think about the division between the heavily industrialised countries and those countries that are, um, you know, particularly see themselves as a, a community of, of uh, more developing countries, you know, so often described as the global south. So thinking about, um, you know, the historic levels of injustice that have existed between those countries, between those, those broad categories of countries, and the fact that that is something that is a background to every conversation and will provide something which we do we we can't wish away. Um, so thinking about particularly you know the defining feature between the global north and the global south is the global north has a lot more resources and the global south has a lot more people. So there will need to be real conversations about we only get sustainability if we're able to think strategically about how resources are made available to improve the sustainability of of all the people's lives in the global south and that means both allowing them access to prosperity but also thinking about how they move into a more sustainable you know that they don't repeat our problems in terms of adopting unsustainable uh, economic and industrial models we've both acknowledged some of the challenging conversations or some of the tensions and uh, one insight or reflection from the summit was a recognition we don't have to agree on everything it's unrealistic to think everyone will agree on everything we're not going to get as you said a kind of a single pure framework but one of the um sorry, key uh sort of, you know areas of feedback was how valuable people found it that we were it was a space for the real conversations the tough conversations and the uh, to use the language a lot of elephants put on the table things that are not often acknowledged or spoken about in conversations that are about sustainability um and I'm interested in your views about what, what was it that was put on the table that was important to acknowledge. We haven't necessarily resolved it or got answers to it, but even just acknowledging it's a thing is important to enable us to move forward and not be the kind of the underlying conversation that we're not having but need to. I'm interested in, in, in what, what did you take as those tough conversations that maybe need more focus in future? I mean, I think I, I, it was so important the fact that we were able to go and have conversations and not you know unrealistically set the goal of moving us all towards consensus but actually explore the uh, the, the discomfort of having those conversations um and some of it you know touched on some of the things i've just been talking about in terms of you know the, the big global landscape so actually the reality of we are a world with great powers that will um, move forward in a in an increasingly real quality way. So we need to navigate that. And there are these historic injustices which colour things. So actually navigating those two two forces is going to be increasingly uh, difficult because they don't always push in the same direction. Um, I think there was also something very important about some of the specific ge geographies that were that were brought up. And that you know, so examples of it, it, this isn't just a generic. Oh, you know, the rise of geopolitics in the conversation that actually we do need to think about some of the specifics. So we had really interesting conversations about the future for India. We had really interesting, fascinating conversations, challenging conversations about um, the role of China and obviously a huge range of perspectives on what that means um, and how to engage with that. But there's something, a conversation that we can't not have. What, one of the things was interesting that happened almost from the very beginning of the conference was uh, people raising the, the situation in Gaza um, and seeing that as being a huge challenge to the apparent legitimacy of, of a rules-based order. So the way that the Western countries were engaging with that. There were also references to, to other things such as, you know, the way um, 
uh, Europe in particular, but also the US engaged post pandemic in response to some of the energy challenges. And so a sense that, you know, the um, industrialized countries will talk about kind of global goods and rules until that becomes unsatisfactory to them, at which point they will prioritize their own and they will push the rules to one side. And that that is actually, whilst in the short term could be useful, is actually maybe in the long term quite damaging. I think other conversations that were really, really um, important where we where you know you saw some of the, the the divisions. One is about economic models. So, you know, within the sustainability landscape, there is obviously a tried and tested as a well trod path about understandably question highlighting the fact that our current economic model is unsustainable. The levels of consumption, particularly in the West, is un unsustainable. But really pushing back on that is this this the reality that for many, most people in the world, the levels of consumption are unsustainable because they are too low. Um, and so, you know, the, the, that is um, a tension that I think many people will, will argue is, has been resolved with particular frameworks, but the reality is it's, it's an argument we're still having, it's a process that we're still working through. It links to, I think, uh, another strand of conversations, which was very much about, you know, where um, you have the, the the limits to individual entitlement, individual ability to uh, have a certain level of liberty, to, to make your own choices about what you consume, so what it's right or wrong for um, you know, the state or companies to or other powerful blocks to, to dictate to individuals versus the fact that we are collectively losing our public goods. So once we've collectively lost those, then no individual freedom will, will give them back. So challenges about like where do you find the navigation there and then i think you know going back to some of the things that, that you talked about earlier there was obviously this big conversation about what is the role of the state what is the role of um markets and how do these things come together and again lots of different perspectives some um i think probably the tenor of the conversation was that uh, in the we have underplayed the role of the state um particularly in, in industrialized countries um up until quite recently but also there is definitely some pushback about not swinging too far in the other direction. So so a lot of kind of interesting things there. But I actually, this brings me back to one of the things I was going to ask you. So, you know, this was a conversation about the economy. This was a conversation about countries, but also we, we work with, particularly with the private sector, business and, and, and in, in particular in finance. What did you take away as some of the, the biggest implications that we might need to draw out for the business community from the, from the conversations that we had? Yes, it was really interesting, even though we had a lot of people in the room in senior positions within business who work with business, so much of the conversation was on the barriers, which aren't actually directly on businesses making, it was the unsustainability of the system. Um, but we did come round to, uh, I suppose, reaching some insights, conclusions around the role of business and some of that uh, around support for effective state action. So I think that recognition that markets uh, and the private sector is really the best solution we've got to be able to uh, drive change, create value, raise quality of, of living globally at pace, at scale. So a uh, critically important role, but without really effective state leadership, we won't get that. So a lot of the conversation is around was around what should business be speaking out in support of. But I think there were some also some important conclusions. I think there was a recognition that there's a real deficit of, of vision. So a, vis a, a business vision, the public sector, uh, sorry, private sector, speaking out in support of action that is good for business, it's good for economies and good for societies. So being a voice of uh, support for a more positive, cleaner, prosperous vision through taking early action and re reminding that actually the sooner we act, the sooner we can collectively reap the economic benefits. The analysis tells us there's an economic upside to action. Uh, this isn't just, uh, you know, of course, there's an existential risk for some. There are fundamental challenges, but there's also a strong economic case for acting now. So I think for business to speak up in support of a positive vision that is not only into the markets, but to citizens, to voters, to politicians, 
that to to rebuild some ambition aspiration towards transition because at the moment a lot of the narrative is about what we stand to lose what's going to be taken away how it's not there how other people will benefit but we whoever we happen to be will lose from it so i think there's an important role for the public a private keep saying public <laughs> there's an important role for the private sector to be part of that um, vision building i think there's also a really important need to to let go or step aside from all of the recent focus which has been predominantly on on reputation um of course you know rankings and data and esg matter but an importance in getting back to focus on long term value long term resilience in the face of these very significant shifts physical geopolitical new liability risks to be looking at these issues through the lens of um long term value creation there's a really important agenda around innovation we often hear we've got all the solutions that we need we do have a lot of solutions uh we but there's there's more that's needed we don't yet have everything we need and that's innovation not just in new technologies in challenging sectors hardware sectors it's innovation in business models and the way decisions are made in financing models in sorting out i suppose the wiring or you know, the kinks in the pipeline so capital can flow where it's needed innovation so we're aligning incentives there's a need around governance um corporate governance we hear from a number of organizations that it's interpretations of fiduciary responsibility interpretations of you know the fundamental purpose of the company and why the business exists that in some places is getting in the way of the business's own long-term interests so a big focus on governance but also um regional sectoral governance how can that be structured so there's a race to the top not the bottom um from the private sector so that businesses are incentivized rewarded for um superior performance on sustainability but i think the most fundamental piece that came out was the need for the private sector to be speaking up supportive of and contributing to really effective regulation enabling incentives i know a lot of the work that you and your teams um focus on are very much in that space so i suppose i'm keen to hear was there anything from the summit conversations that had implications for our work and that of our leaders groups i think i think there's there's quite a few things actually and it's a really good question i mean the the some of this goes to the messaging and and how we make the case for things that i think we've been making the case for for a while so so as CISL and working through things like our corporate leaders groups and our, our financial groups we have been you know obviously making the case for various sustainability trans- transformations the the summit reminds us we know this anyway but i think it reminds us and makes it much clearer and much clearer about the scale of this that those arguments need to be situated in in a changing landscape in a world where we can't purely rely on the navigating by the immediate pressures of of sustainability so you know the case for action on climate change has been made in in terms of climate change and will continue to be made but actually we also need to work out how that interacts with energy security how it interacts with resource security how it interacts with the race to develop new industries and present messages in those terms and so i think that was that was really powerful and something that we were autom- already sought to to address but the flip side to this is you know as we think about what some of the actions some of some of the the the, spe- the things that need to be done in terms of rolling forward so both the particular ways that different parts of the economy will will evolve but also the the policy measures that have the most uh, purchase on on driving change we need to think about how it interacts with this whole overall landscape so you know one of the the lessons obviously of the last 2 or 3 years is um the US has passed its inflation reduction act that that's a a piece of legislation that delivers not just for climate it, ap- it absolutely leverages a far greater uh, strand of investment into um the US green economy um it also delivers for uh jobs and and better social outcomes in the US at least in terms of, of what it's set up to do and it is about winning an economic advantage for the US in, in many terms so you know the visibility of the things that w- will deliver these kind of win-wins move things forward on multiple fronts this is clearly the strategies that will will work um at least in the, in the immediate term and so working out what that means increasingly we can't 
I don't think CISL has been as you know too guilty of this ever, but in, but I think that we we've, we've tried to join join the dots, but increasingly I think what joining the dots means we can't ignore that. That does mean you know the climate challenge is is squarely and firmly part of an overall challenge to deliver economic outcomes, well-being, um, the the kind of like an improved life outcomes that most people expect and, and want to see. Um, it also means thinking about the biodiversity collapse, but it also does mean navigating a world of resource competition and geopolitical tension. And so thinking about what it means in those terms and thinking about how we improve things. And so, you know, CISL, within our purpose, we've articulated this this vision of delivering a stable economy for people, nature and climate. Um, Sometimes we've, we've got various bits of work on touching on each of those things, but increasingly seeing how they all come together and where we can we can deliver to multiple goals is going to be going to have to be the priority. So being able to tick multiple boxes in one go. And just on the uh, how one deals with how individual organisations or groups of organisations deal with decision making in the context of all of that complexity, having to deliver for multiple outcomes, we expressly tackled that within the conversation, recognising that there are not easy answers, and it's incredibly challenging within this context for people who have the intent to make good long-term strategic decisions, but that it, they're not being actually very clear answers or options. So I'm interested on reflections on, on what we took from the conversation in relation specifically relating to decision-making. I mean, you know, really important part of the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, throughout this conversation, we've been talking about the, the levels of change, the levels of um, volatility that we're seeing. And, you know, if I go back to, to you, some of your first things, first answers, it was, it is very, very clear that, that the more that we, we look to the future, we realise that the past is a, is a extremely poor analogy for what the future will look like. We're in a, a changing world. We're in a changing world because of growing sustainability impacts, but we're also in a changing world because of who, who gets to say, how they get to say is different. And then as we look at some of the kind of core sustainability challenges, we realise that what's required is the ability to envisage not just how things will change, because they will change, uh, but also how things can change and to be able to explore that. A lot of the kind of the tools that leaders use, whether in business or government, are built on data, on an understanding, on a granularity of the way the world is. And they don't allow the ability to really map the dynamism of a world that is changing to that extent. Particularly, I think they don't allow us to be able to think about, in the world, with all its complexity, how it how it can change and to envisage what the implications of new futures will be. So that's going, so being able to build new tools, new models, new ways of thinking about the world that allow people to imagine new, pro, new choices in front of them and to explore what the dynamics in the system will look like given that you, you know, the system is joined up, will be really important. And so there's a big piece there about the fact that there is so much expertise, there is so much understanding. We, you know, we're probably you know, out there in the world in institutions like Cambridge and, and elsewhere, um, but we need to make sure that that expertise is not sitting in silos, but is being joined up and being made accessible to leaders. And that means that you know, leaders not only be, need to be willing to experiment and try new things, try new tools, but they also need to be able to think about, ex express some kind of judgment about which tools will be useful and necessary for which purposes. But there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of exciting possibilities. Obviously, we're seeing, you know, this is where the technology piece might be one of the more positive sides. We're seeing the rise of machine learning and AI, so there may be more tools that are available there. But it might be that that will give us some useful things. It might be that in other places we need to step away from that. We need to focus on things that are more easily manageable and so people can understand the dynamics within them um, so that they can understand, you know, when when a particular outcome comes out of the model, it's not a black box, but they understand the dynamics within them. So there's a lot to work through in that, but there's definitely a need for change. So, you know, this... We've tried to set out in this conversation like this range of deep, sometimes conflictual, um, certainly challenging conversations that we've, we've had. You said up front, like one of the key takeaways from the conversation was a leadership deficit. 
obviously leadership is in our name. What do you think are some of the things that we would expect, or hope to see from leaders going forward that could improve the situation, help us navigate this landscape? Yeah, this, uh, I think there was a, a clear recognition, not surprisingly, from the conversation we convened that, that these issues really are the defining leadership agenda right now. I think, and there are a number of uh, insights, conclusions from this. The first is, back to your points a moment ago, the need to recognise this is complex and messy, to not look for simple solutions to um, really complex and complicated matters. So just to recognise that's what it is and, and stop looking for the single answer. I think there was an, a, a really important strand about the importance, the moral courage, the telling the truth, that we shouldn't be leaving it to, to our children, to uh, activists in societies. We should be recognising that um, a lot of climate scientists are having their voices shut down or, or you know, experiencing a huge amount of, of abuse. There are very few voices speaking up and, and really telling the truth about the nature and the scale of the challenges, but not simply being open and levelling and telling people you know, how it is. Also, back to the point about vision, speaking up in support of change will, you know, it won't necessarily be that drastic and it will be good. So a really important leadership role. You're not a leader if nobody's following and people won't want to follow if, if they're, you know, coming from a place of fear of things being taken away. So that contributing to that positive vision for how the future through action can be better in an individual, organisational, societal, you know, natural environment level. Um, so I think those are uh, a couple of fundamentals, but I think there's also something really important about um, the role of leaders in this context that we've outlined. There's no, you know, of course we need, you know, great charismatic people who will just get stuff done, but we can't rely on heroes who are going to solve it for us and we can't set ours up to fail by positioning ourselves as the people with all the answers or the people who can deliver all of the change. We need to better recognise that most people in some way do want to contribute. They do want to be part of building a better future. And rather than positioning people only as, you know, they can only vote or they can only go buy, have a choice of product, really enabling, facilitating, catalyzing much greater engagement and action by a much broader range of people. I think that has to be an important priority for leadership. It's enabling huge at scale action by others, not simply seeking to, to solve it ourselves. And then I think there's also the the piece that is recognising that it might not be popular, that just because it's not popular doesn't make it wrong in the short term. You know, we are, are seeing some backlash. We are seeing some anti-net zero, anti-ESG um, narratives in the West. We are seeing um, leaders within financial institutions, within businesses, feeling pressure to stop talking about sustainability. So finding ways to bring this back to the table through the lens of value not seeking to run with the herd and run with the pack, but seeking to shift the conversation, shift the pack, because this is good for business and good for societies. So I think being clear, purposeful, strategic, and being true to, to what's right for the long term rather than just what's popular in the short term. And that takes some personal courage and resilience as well. So final thoughts. So we, we kicked off this conversation. We held... Uh, one particularly useful dialogue event. Does it stop there or are we, how are we going to carry this on? Uh, I think it's a really important space, a really important contribution that we can make. The intention was never to have a single conversation. In some ways it was an experiment and I think a really valuable one. And all of the uh, insight we've gained, all of the feedback we've had is that this kind of conversation, this kind of space that we've created is incredibly valuable. I think um, it's important that this doesn't remain a conversation just within an elite Western institution. Um, we need to be part of contributing to, to conversations um, with other actors in other parts of the world where we're building a, that, you know, that spirit of, of openness, constructive and mutual you know, recognition and respect, but willing to deal with the tough stuff in support of generating new insights, new solutions, new actionable ideas. So we will definitely be taking this forward, both within our international um, offices and activities, but also importantly, within our network, we have 40,000 individuals who've engaged with us in some way, and who we regularly hear are keen to be part of such conversations, such dialogues in future. Great. Thanks for talking to, us, to me, Lindsay. Thank you.